Department almost needed to do this video on Steve Hayes after his recent death. Mr. Hayes was a prolific blogger at the outstanding site Trial Blog. Like most of his readers, I was not aware of his health problems and his passing came as a bit of a shock. Because even near the end of his life, which we didn't know was near the end of his life, because he didn't tell anybody, his posts were educational, deeply logical, consistent with scripture, and always made you think. I never met Mr. Hayes, but I truly miss him and his fine work. His blog was the only resource I read almost every day. Hayes took on all comers, and he posted excellent, well-reasoned articles on a vast number of subjects, from atheism to Islam to UFOs to ghosts, mathematics, logic, tag, cults, apologetic methods, philosophy, doctrine, and more. Hayes really engaged different views, especially non-Christian ideas, and especially atheism. He did this through social media, and it was a real delight to read his conversations he had with heretics and unbelievers, because he would post it, he would post many of these dialogues for the benefit of his readers there on Trialog. I do not know anyone who could take his place. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of people I can say that about, but with Steve Hayes, because he was so prolific, because he did take on everybody, that was an arrogant scripture. I don't know if there's anybody that can take his place. He was so rational, so clear, so fearless in opposing false worldviews. I do not see anybody that can fill his shoes. Thankfully, we have his, his e-books and the massive amount of his posts. There's over 3,000 posts by Hayes just on atheism on trial blog. So make sure you go there. Make sure you, you bookmark that site. It's a great site. I do not feel sad for Steve. He is in the glorious, loving, joy-filled presence of our Lord Jesus. Even if you disagree with Steve on selected areas of apologetics, theology, or philosophy, you always learn something and you get closer to the truth through his work. So today I'm going to go through a few of Steve's posts that really benefited me. I'll go through just a few, perhaps not even his best, because I read every line of hundreds of Mr. Hayes' posts. Steve was taught by the grand theologian and philosopher and apologist John Frame. Mr. Hayes was at least a friend of presuppositional apologetics. I may be a hardcore presub guy, but I know Steve was absolutely brilliant, and I learned a lot from him and will continue to learn a lot from him until I get blessed like he did and close my eyes on earth for the last time and open my eyes up in the fields of heaven and fall at the feet of my glorious Savior Jesus. And then sometimes later, much later, I'll meet Steve for the first time as my brother. The first post of Steve Hayes that I want to discuss, Hayes wrote in September of 2016 called There's No Evidence for Atheism. Almost everything I'm going to go through is going to be the words of Steve Hayes. I'll try to make that real clear when I add a little bit of uh, exposition on maybe what he said. Hayes writes in this post, there's no evidence for atheism. He writes, the debate between atheism and Christian theism has such a radical disparity. There is no positive evidence for atheism. The case for atheism boils down to an argument from silence. Atheists don't really present any positive evidence for atheism. Rather, they argue against theism. This is such a great point, because atheism in principle cannot have any evidence. And above and beyond that, only the Christian worldview can account for the transcendent tools that are used in the attainment and the analysis of any evidence, including the evidence regarding God. Now Hayes continues, I quote, the case for atheism boils down to the alleged lack of evidence for a God who intervenes in the world. Or take the claim that answers to prayers are random. Likewise, the argument from evil is an appeal to randomness. Some atheists allege <coughs> that biological organisms exhibit design flaws. That allegation is refutable on different grounds, but in any event, it's not a positive argument for atheism. A few atheists say God talk is meaningless. 
That poses a bit of dilemma as much as it's no longer clear what atheism is denying. <laughs> it's it's kind of self-stultifying to say that God talk is meaningless. In any event, that's not a positive argument for atheism, Hayes says. He goes on, many atheists find the Bible is morally repugnant. Of course, many atheists reject moral realism. In any event, that's not a positive argument for atheism. If you go down the list, atheists don't offer any evidence for atheism except, in the roundabout sense, the claim that there is no evidence for God. <laughs> atheists love to say some reasons why they say that is they're lazy, but usually it's they know, they know the evidence and the proof is out there. They just don't care, and uh, of course they reject the evidence because they don't want God to exist. They know he exists, but they don't want him to. That's my little addition there. Hayes goes on, though, to say, In some respects, the argument for atheism is odd. Once again, take the argument from evil. How does evil undercut Christian theism? After all, Christian theism is predicated on the existence of evil. So how can evil be inconsistent with Christian theism? It's not the presence of evil, but the absence of evil that would falsify Christian theism. By the same token, how can the argument from evil disprove or even undercut biblical theism when biblical theism grants the existence of evil? It's not as if the Bible depicts a utopian world. So there really is no direct evidence for atheism. By contrast, Christian scholars and philosophers marshal realms of evidence, reams of evidence, excuse me, for Christianity. And like I said, atheists come on my YouTube channel and they come on Twitter and they say, where's your evidence? There is no evidence. And of course, on Twitter, I have hundreds and hundreds of posts on the evidence and proof for God. And on YouTube, I have hundreds of videos on the evidence and proof for God. So <laughs> they didn't even want to look. Of course, they won't look because they just want to argue because they don't want to believe. Steve Hayes goes on. And it's important to keep our eye on the burden of proof. In the case of atheism, is an argument from silence, then it takes next to nothing to overthrow it. Suppose 99% of the evidence for God is naturally explainable. If just 1%, indeed even less than 1%, gets through, then atheism is false. Atheism cannot permit a single counterexample to slip through. What a fabulous point. And of course, like you said, there's reams of evidence. There's a colossal amount of evidence and proof for the existence of God. Another post by Steve Hayes I really enjoyed. Remember, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them on Triblog. Make sure you go there. It's, it's called Self-Hating Atheism. He says this, Paul Draper is one of the better representatives. Atheism Draper says, more importantly, if theism is true, this is an atheist saying this, but Steve is posting this, if theism is true, then God is not morally perfect. He is omnipotent, so we can make many diff different sorts of intelligent life, probably infinitely many, including intelligent beings that are much more impress impressive than human beings. <laughs> so that's Draper's argument. And human beings have many features that make them an unlikely choice. That's what the atheist Draper says. Hayes responded, he says, Draper is a self-hating atheist. <laughs> you can see Steve doesn't hold back. Steve goes on to say, the existence of unimpressive humans like Draper is evidence that God doesn't exist? <laughs> of course, that's a bit of a paradox. If God made more impressive creatures instead of humans, then humans like Draper would be in no position to complain about how unimpressive they are since they wouldn't exist in the first place. <laughs> then there's the standard comparison, impressive to whom? Valuable to whom, since any creature God made, however great, would be infinitely inferior to God's surpassing greatness. God can't be impressed by any creature. What a fabulous point. It's nonsensical to say a creature could be impressive in relation to God. Powerful point by Steve. He continues, valuable to whom? Well, most humans value their own existence. Most humans value other humans. Apparently, Draper means impressive relative to some hypothetically greater creature. Even so, why would God care about that, since any creature would be unimpressive by God's standards? We're talking about a pecking order of unimpressive creatures where, at best, one 
unimpressive creature is more unimpressive or less unimpressive than another. Hard to see how degrees of unimpressiveness would single out any candidate. Sure, I'm unimpressive, but you're even more unimpressive. <laughs> you can see Mr. Hayes's wit, which made reading his post compared to other creatures. Einstein, Newton, unimpressive. That's a hard case to make, but Hayes continues. Draper fails to dis distinguish between the creation and the fall. Draper commits a common mistake with respect to omnipotence. If an omnipotent God uses natural means, that limits what he can do. That doesn't mean he's limited to natural means. He can often bypass natural processes to produce a particular result directly. But if he's making physical organisms, if he's making a physical world, in which things usually operate by natural process of cause and effect, then that's a self-imposed restriction on the field of action. Fabulous point. And it's possible that our far-flung universe does not contain, it's possible that our far-flung universe does contain more impressive creatures than humans. That's another good point. So Hayes rationally demolishes another atheist. Steve could do this to pretty much every single atheist I ever uh, had the opportunity to read a dialogue that Steve posted. Steve was very, very impressive with his wit, with his intelligence, and seeing logical fallacies and exposing the error. It's not just because Steve was brilliant, which he was. It's because Steve had the case of Christianity and the Christian worldview, which has all the evidence and all the proof. In fact, proof requires God to exist for there even be something we can call proof. He goes on in another post, uh, an article from October 2014, Bubble Wrapped Atheism. Steve Hayes writes, Recently I noted Jeff Lauder posted an intellectually confused critique of an article by Wallace. Lauder has responded with an intellectually confused reply to my observations. At least he's consistent, <laughs> albeit consistently confused. You gotta love his wit. Steve goes on to say, in commenting on his critique of Wallace, I drew attention to the fact that Jeff fails to distinguish between the logical implications of atheism and what individual atheists happen to believe. Jeff denies this. Yet, that's exactly what he does. For instance, Jeff tries to counter Wilson's contention that morality is, I quote, an illusion fobbled off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. End of quote of Wilson by Hayes. But that confuses atheism with atheists. The fact that some atheists subscribe to objective moral values and duties doesn't make his subscription a logical implication of atheism. Indeed, his position could be logically incompatible with atheism. Likewise, Jeff tries to prove that atheism is neutral on morality with name-dropping footnotes. But that, once again, illustrates my point. Citing what any particular atheist believes is a separate issue from the logical implications of atheism. This is brilliant. Hayes goes on. For one thing, many atheists try to make the best of the losing hand they dealt themselves. They labor to turn a losing hand into a winning hand. They don't face up to the unrelenting, bleak consequences of atheism. I needn't re reinvent the wheel for Jeff's benefit. Remember, Jeff's the atheist. I've been defending my claims about logical, the logical implications and the radical consequences of atheism for 10 years on my blog. Hayes continues, I tag some of his comments as village atheist material. <laughs> I always love that tag. Well, I do that when their arguments operate at that level. Confused or village atheist is to characterize some of his arguments that, that seems to be exceedingly tame compared to what the Bible reveals about unbelievers. And that's also good. If anything, my language is charitable to a fault by biblical standards. A lot of modern American Christians, of course, fail to understand this. They often confuse niceness with kindness. Sometimes you're actually being kind by not being nice to, say, an atheist or a non-believer or a person cut in a false religion. Just patting them on the back saying, oh, you're wonderful, your worldview is great, and being nice to them is not being kind to them because now they're still on their way to hell. So that's not being nice, or that's not being kind. So niceness is not kindness. But Steve goes on to say, he notes, let the raw radical implications of atheism sink in. His moral vanity binds him to the abyss. 
It's like a concentration camp where the guards are never rude. They politely ask inmates to step into the gas chambers. They say, please and thank you. Be oblivious to the surroundings. Be oblivious to your face. Smile a lot. Admire a fresh coat of paint on the gas chambers. Jeff goes on, goes through life in a bubble-wrapped atheism. He doesn't allow himself to see himself from the viewpoint of the universe if atheism is worthless, utterly worthless. He's defending a worthless creed that renders him worthless. He plays a straight man to the gallows humor of the universe. The straight man never gets a joke. He's too serious because he takes himself too seriously to ever catch on the fact that the joke is on him. Even though Jeff, the atheist, found at the secular web, he doesn't see himself as atheism sees him. He doesn't see himself for what he is if what he says is true under atheism. One reason for this is that atheism is too degrading to take. The other reason is that atheism is false. An atheist is a rebel, a creature made in God's image, a creature who must think and live in God-defined reality. As a result, an atheist can't help but view himself as something with inherent value. He doesn't take to the role that atheism assigns him to. It's too unreal, too impossible. And of course, that ends that particular article. <laughs> you can see the fine work of Steve Hayes. Now, I try to get some unique posts here. Not Like I said, not necessarily his greatest posts. You can look those up on Trial Blog. But some that might bring forth some unique perspectives on atheism and other worldviews. Another trial blog post by Steve Hayes I really recommend is, Why did new atheism fail so miserably? Steve writes, Atheism will shamble on as some sort of undead abomination, <laughs> chanting, Brains! Brains! Are what fundies don't have. <laughs> as the living run away, shrieking, but everyone else has long since passed by. A charitable reading, new atheists weren't reading weren't reaching their intellectual opponents. They were coming into educated, urban, liberal spaces saying things that educated, urban, liberals already believed. This is 90% of popular intellectual culture these days, progressive regurgitating progressivism to other progressives for nothing but the warm glow of being told, yep, that was old, good, progressive ideas. Atheism caught flat-footed, mouth wide open, but, but, but we thought we were supposed to. We thought. You can see that's just a great little post by Steve Hayes on Trial Blog. Another fine article by Mr. Hayes is from April 2006. So you can see how far it goes back. And I, I really recommend the ebooks that he participated in on also on the side of Trial Blog. It's called A Response to an Ex-Believer and His Deluded Self-Debunker Buddies. <laughs> Hayes writes, Notice a massive amount of terms and sentences with emotional baggage attached to them. E.g. magic bean, permafrost of religious illusion, etc. Unfortunately, no actual argument was given, just a series of assertions. Bethrick is a liar and is well known for being full of hot air. He fails to understand his opponent and is well known for not understanding arguments. He just puts it right on the line. Aside from the fact that this does not show that we misunderstand the principle of induction simply because we fail to question Hume's concept of the principle of induction, this shows Bethrick's total ignorance on the history of philosophy. Hayes, like I said, didn't hold back. Steve Hayes continues, In all my philosophy books, when I read on the principle of induction, Hume was brought up. No, sorry, he says all of his books on philosophy. One could say that Hume's question is the problem of induction. The problem is, what gives us the right to reason from particular instances of our experience to generalized conclusion? That's the problem. Hmm, Bertrand Russell, Bertrand Russell that naive hack in parentheses, agrees in Russell's problem, problems of philosophy. And let's see, oh, Plod Jones, excuse me, edited book, The Theory of Knowledge, Classical and Contemporary Reasons, agrees as well. From a single experience, we sometimes make an inductive leap to many. For some of a certain kind, we often make a leap to judgments about the experience of a kind. But through inductive probability is psychologically inescapable, we have trouble providing a rational justification for it. It was David Hume who first raised the problem of induction, end of quote. 
continuing Steve's post here, the Oxford Companion to Philosophy. The problem is also attributed to Hume, and is roughly laid out as I did above, Hayes mentions, by epistemic sad sack, sad sacks, Robert Audi, hack par excellence. <laughs> His book, Epistemology, a Contemporary Introduction to the Problems of Knowledge. The reason he calls these, uh, these uh, basis of inferring observed matters of fact to unobserved matters of fact. Indeed, since it's Hume's problem, then one could make the argument that if you do not state Hume's problem, you're not stating the principle of induction. Very, very good point. Atheist Brethrick had previously squawked, he takes Rand's Sado philosophy approach to solving the principle of induction. He even admits that this is not well known in some academic circles. Well, he's being generous. Actually, it's not well known in most academic circles. That's a form of Rand's awful attempt at solving the problem of induction. Rand was an atheist. The principle of induction, this atheist, using Rand's objectivist axioms, thinks he solves the problem using that. So Steve posits Rand's answer. The axiom appealed to is a law of identity, A equals A. We read that as how objectivists understand the problem. When Thorne writes, Christian, as a creator and sustainer of the universe, God guarantees the laws of nature, non-believer. So in essence, you hold that God is required for A to be A. <laughs> See, that's this atheist use of Rand's solution to the problem of induction. Steve retorts all that nonsense. He says, notice for this atheist, A equals A is how to answer the question as to how one knows the nature, that nature is uniform. But nature is uniform is A is B. <laughs> See, A refutes this guy by just showing him how illogical this Rand follower was. Hayes goes on to say, A is A breaks down to nothing more than nature is nature. The problem for and Ayn Rand followers, nature as nature tells us nothing about how nature behaves. Thus, it doesn't even touch the problem of induction. Steve continues refuting Ayn, or Rand. The theist in the conversation should say, God may be required for the laws of identity, but that's not what I said. I said that God guarantees a general law-like governing of the universe. That nature operates with general uniformity is law in a law like law-like way does not translate to the claim that nature is nature. He's completely demolishing this Ayn Rand follower's idea of solving the problem of induction through Ayn Rand's false philosophy. Nature could still be nature, Hayes goes on to say, yet not behave orderly. Nature may act lawlessly and it would still be nature. That makes sense. Another atheist states, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not well versed on tag. However, if you want a layman's opinion, it makes no sense to me. I know it's precept, but how can you justify a presupposition? If I were to presuppose the existence of, say, the flying spaghetti monster using the same argument, the theist would refute it. Yet some use the very same argument to justify the existence of something just as well proved, namely God. I just don't get it. That's the end of the atheist comment. Then Steve Hayes replies, Thanks for your opinion. Ventilians would argue that presuppositions are justified transcendentally. Fine, presuppose a flying spaghetti monster, Hayes continues. That's my argument. Everyone presupposes some ultimate authority. Let's see if said being can provide the transcendentals. You couldn't use the same argument since a flying spaghetti monster is not Trinitarian. If you end up making it all the same as my argument, then all you're doing is saying that my worldview is correct. Yet, you just call it by a different name, but who's afraid of my worldview dressed up? So positing the flying spaghetti monster or another god that has the same exact attributes of the biblical god is just using a rose by any other name. But they don't do that. They're not wise enough to do, even do that, which would also refute their position, as Steve's making clear. But Steve Hayes goes on, he adds, Appealing to the flying spaghetti monster does not help out your atheism anyways. If the flying spaghetti, spaghetti monster could provide the transcendentals, then you refute atheism, naturalism, and physicalism. <laughs> so they lose either way. Hayes continues. Now, if you want to say that you wouldn't refute that because a flying spaghetti monster is a physical being in the natural world, 
then you'd have a rough time trying to argue for non-physical laws of logic and morality, etc. That's just one reason the flying spaghetti monster can't be God. Steve Hayes observes, Vantillian, the Vantillian program where all things prove the existence of God, Gray Bonson has written about just a few of the things tags, TAG aims to prove. Predication, reason, explanation, interpretation, learning, certainty, universals, possibility, cause, substance, being, or purpose, things that TAG would aim to prove. So the mixed hypothetical runs, if predication, reason, explanation, interpretation, learning, certainty, universals, possibility, cause, substance, being, or purpose, counting, coherence, unity, or system and experience, or in a conception of a universe, logic, connecting to facts, unchanging natures, or laws in a chance universe, uniformity, science, connecting logic and facts, excuse me, I said that twice, or predication to reality, avoiding contradictions, avoiding irrationalism or skepticism, since... Predication, reason, explanation, interpretation, learning, certainty, universals, all the way through the whole list there. Therefore, God is the case. <laughs> Powerful argument. The atheist replies, The way presuppositionalists normally attempt to justify their first premise seems to be to say something along the line, Prove to me the universal laws of logic can exist without God. You can't, therefore, my premise is true. Steve Hayes responds a few things. If the argument was that you could not account for or make sense of logic within your worldview, then you need to show how you can. Of course, atheists can't. Since you have a burden as well, you need to show how you can reason just by being an autonomous being. If you assume that you can have logic without God, then you're begging the question against my worldview. So you can't just assume you're autonomous and not expect to have to justify your autonomy. We're debating entire worldviews. And Steve Hayes continues, if your argument assumes universal laws of logic, then you must offer an account of such things, how such things are possible, unless you just want some freebies. And that's uh, the end of today's video. I really appreciate all Steve's work on Triablog, as well as the other uh, people that post on Triablog. Keep up the good work, and all you Christians, you know, defend the faith, uh, and Rejoice in the truth in Scripture. Trust in Jesus, because Jesus is everything. He should be everything to you. His death on this cross, his burial, his resurrection, the gospel. Trust that. Share that. Defend it. And be a warrior like Steve Hayes. Hopefully God will raise up hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands, perhaps millions of defenders of the faith who move in such wit and, and understanding and analysis as Steve Hayes has done, but he is one in a million. God bless Steve Hayes, and uh, God bless the folks at Trial Law.